Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Are ready to go. Welcome, everybody, to the first session of the afternoon. I hope you had a great lunch. My name is uh, Stuart Tansley. I'm from Microsoft Research Connections. I'm director for the Natural User Interface theme uh, as part of our computer science theme uh, led by Judith Bishop, who's in the audience today. Thank you for coming, Judith. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the NUI Research Snapshot session. Uh, if you didn't want to learn about NUI, then uh, you're in the wrong session. Uh, we have four wonderful academic uh, speakers today. I decided that we wouldn't have any Microsoft speakers, just, just um, uh, faculty and researchers today. And uh, without further ado, um, uh, time is short. We've got to get four great speakers in. I will hand over immediately to our first, spe uh, pr pr first speaker, Professor Pat Bowdish from Hasso Plattner Institute, um, also uh, part of um, uh, Potsdam University. I uh, think to save him some time, I will save the introduction. So straight over to Pat. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, just for once, I actually rehearsed this talk, and uh, I just I figured out I finished in 30 minutes and six seconds, and I was very proud of myself. And I come in, and, and Stuart says to me, OK, I'll give you a signal after 15 so you can finish on time in 20. And so I realized there's a fourth speaker in the session. So if this feels like the fire hose, probably because it is. OK, so I'll make this really quick. So I want to talk about natural user interfaces. And the main thing that kind of, kind of propels the work I'm doing is the idea that that natural interaction is one that takes place in a single unified space where all the spatial relationships are extremely easy as a result. And there will be feet as well. All right, so when you look back at natural user interfaces, traditional interaction with computers has been very asymmetric. On the one hand, we had computers seeing, uh, I'm sorry, users seeing computers in very much graphical detail, such as see the, uh, the, the star. On the other hand, if you, if you had ever asked a computer what a user looks like, the computer might have said, I think computer, uh, users look like that, right? Because the only thing that for 40 years that, that computers you know, mainstream computers saw of users was just a moving coordinate cross. And so this asymmetry is changing nowadays, but for the time being, we still essentially still live in the 60s. This is the mouse invented by Doc Engelbart. This is Doc Engelbart, you know, doing the mother of all demos, where he essentially demonstrated most of the things we're still using on our desktops today. But the world's changing, and so today, and actually this is a picture here showing uh, Henry Benko is in the audience right now, and Andy Wilson. Um, the world's changing in the sense that we're actually starting to use cameras and camera-based systems to look back at users. And I think that's, in my personal perception, the main paradigm shift behind NUI. So we see computers through graphical user interface or whatever it is, and computers see us. And they're interested in new challenges because at the same time, we have much more data about users, but we also, the data we get is much less reliable and requires much more interpretation. So the influences that propel this field coming from new sources now. So Technology that was traditionally used in things like you know, motion capture and films and stuff like that actually now becomes part of the interaction how we deal with users. Also the stuff that's made for video games, you know, also based on motion capture. So systems that look, for example, like this, like a Vicon motion capture system. So what happens here is, is that um, you know, users are wearing markers. You know, and we actually recognize the position of things in 3D space. Now, the only drawback that prevents us from using that in mainstream things is the fact that this installation that you see is somewhere in the half million to one million dollar range. And I think that's essentially where like, this recent big kind of transition happened because of mass availability. So when you're thinking about um, Connect, I would say it's essentially a motion capture approach for the masses. And uh, the same, I think, holds again, like here, I picked two Microsoft products here, uh, Connect and, and Surface. These are mechanisms that give, you know, provide you with a kind of 2D spatial input in a very natural way on a la large and comparably inexpensive way. So raises the question, what is so natural about this interaction? Which again gives rise to the question, what is natural in the first place? And so it turns out I had this wonderful discussion with Dennis Wixon, also from Microsoft, at a workshop last year, and he said, you know, when the term natural user interfaces was, was kind of debated, you know, he said, like, well, we were not really thinking of anything particularly. We just wanted to say it was not GUI, um, which is kind of the same as saying this is a wireless network or a horseless carriage. It's kind of defined by what it's not. But I think there's a lot of space to kind of define what it is. So my personal take on NUI is 
I think new is the idea of building on kind of the metaphor of the world around us, which, you know, as someone with a mathematical education, I think of as Euclidean space. So Euclidean space is interesting because it has a lot of wonderful properties. Um, you know, two points, you can draw a line, you know, there are spatial relationships and angles in these things. But most of all, we all grew up in Euclidean space. So we know, you know, little babies, they look at things and move their hands together, suggesting that they like what they look at. And uh, so we understand, we, we start to interpret like, things like gaze, we start to interpret like, things like pointing. Uh, we understand physics and ballistics. If you throw something, we get a sense of where it's going to land, there's inertia. We can build up spatial memory. And these are all interesting properties that are inherent to a system that kind of lives in this unified space. When I was still at Microsoft many years ago, um, I had this discussion with Gary Starkweather, and they were always talking about 3D interfaces. And there was a lot of debate if the naturalness of 3D space comes from the fact that it's 3D. And, you know, I personally disagree. I think it's not the 3Dness of the space that makes it natural. It's just the fact that it, you know, has these Euclidean properties. If we make a 2D touchscreen, I think it's just as natural. It's just one dimension less. So I tend to think, you know, a natural user interface is one that has a single unified Euclidean space. So in the 1970s, things actually started out pretty well. When you look at the star user interface, there's space, you know, icons are in the space, there are windows and so on. It was not particularly physical for that matter, and it was more the things we added on top that kind of did not exactly go with the metaphor. We also used an indirect pointing device, in that case a mouse, and I think that's one of the things that actually improved. Um, in this example here on the right, if you take this phone and put it on top of your data, they're physically co-located, but they're also logically co-located, so everything starts to get integrated. Um, there's a lot of things we don't do in NUI, a lot of mappings and distortions and, and so on, which are kind of taboo in some ways. And then the interesting question is like how natural is, is, is connect on the scale that I just discussed. And it turns out it's kind of almost because there's still two spaces. There's the space that the users are in. So the spatial relationship between the players is fully preserved and is meaningful. But there's a second space, which is the screen space, and they're not fully integrated yet. So these are interesting challenges for the future. So let me show a couple of the things that we've done in that space. Um, and um, I'm just first going to show a selection of four devices that we built, which are all kind of dealing with kind of preserving naturalness in Euclidean space and fringe cases. So the first one is, is, off, um, is back of device interaction, a project I actually still started while at Microsoft. The main idea is we wanted to allow people to not occlude screen space. Right? When they're interacting, it's very difficult if you want to have precise manipulation, but you're on top of the screen. The idea was we need to be good off the screen, but that actually preserve, uh, was not possible to preserve the natural interaction. So we moved it to the very back of the screen, uh, generating kind of this natural one-to-one -one matching between the two. The concept itself, as it continues to scale, will allow us to make small and small devices. This is our version of, of a watch, you know, a pendant, a clip-on, or even a ring form factor. They all follow the same function. Screen is entirely on the front, the back side is entirely touch sensitive, and the side's a bunch of buttons. And for that matter, it does scale with whatever technology gives you that year. Um, the second is oftentimes we want to make something touch sensitive, but we can't because the material doesn't really allow us to. So we presented this at WIST last year, a new sensing technology called, well, based on time domain reflectometry. You can see here as I touch this cable in two, two locations, I get a signal that tells me where the string is being touched. And uh, the technology goes back to the 50s when people used this technology to find flaws in a cable. So if you had a cable across the Atlantic and you, and, and you knew it wasn't working anymore, it's not really an option to pull the cable out to find out where it's broken. So what you do instead is you inject a ping, and the ping normally will make it all, all the way through the cable, but if it hits a, 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 some sort of distortion, a capacitive of influence in the middle, you get a partial echo and you measure how long it takes, and you divide by two times the speed of light about, and you find out where this is. So in our West paper, we demonstrate how we can make interesting form factors with that. So for example, rather than like having some controls, I can actually make you know, physical objects that cables themselves touch sensitive. Or here, if I want to have like some sort of guitar pickup thing, I can do that. It's very easy to extend this way because it's only this pair of cables, so we can actually tag them along and daisy chain them. So if I have like a piano that's not long enough, I just add like another segment to that. And um, and the next step, we actually kind of took this concept and made it more available to prototyping. We used um, this is just a regular roll of masking tape. We just applied these two copper wires, and now if I want to enable something, I just take my my special tape and just wrap it around whatever I want. So if I want this uh, this bucket there to be my my steering wheel for this game, I can just do that easily. Um, you're going to see more about floors in a couple of minutes, um, but we also use that to touch enable a floor. 
And um, let's see. Yeah, that was one of the things. We also did some Hilbert curves, so we can embed this. We think this is interesting for wearable computing, that we embed this into clothing. And this is probably my favorite here. We, uh, we use conductive ink, and so we can draw this on, on any object we want, um, and then we can touch enable it that way. So th th what's cool about it is the way it works is there's always just this one wire pair that goes all the way across, and that gives me this touch, and, uh, touch capacity. The reflectometer is, is from the 70s that we use. We have a new one now. It's an expensive technology because it's not mass fabricated yet, but we think this could be interesting in that space. Um, another interesting case is screenless devices. So screenless devices traditionally operated with gestures, which I don't think of as natural, even though they count as well, but they don't follow my discussion uh, earlier, my definition of what I think of as natural. So this is Daniel here, a student in our group, and he's interacting as if he had a touch screen, but without the touch screen. So as you can see, there's a, what he's doing is, is picked up, and actually let me rerun this video here. So he's wearing this little camera here. It puts out some infrared illumination that illuminates his, his hands. A little cam in the middle kind of captures the position of the hands with respect to each other. And then his left hand kind of defines a coordinate frame, and he draws inside of this. So you could envision doing this in the middle of a phone conversation. Here's the, the follow-up we did to this, shown at, whist, at this, uh, the last WIST. So Stephanie is actually going to answer a phone call without taking the phone out of her pocket. And she didn't just touch her hand, she just touched a button. So let me, this is Sean's hand. He is going to show you how to set the alarm to uh, 9.30. And as you get here, the hand actually, all the locations on the hand are mapped to the phone. The phone normally rests in the pocket. Um, here we're using depth cameras in this case. Um, in this particular case, it's actually a time of flight camera. And we're, as you can see on the left, we're segmenting the two hands to determine where the pointing hand is with, with respect to the, the hand that's being pointed at. And then uh, we have like a hacked uh, um, demon running inside of the, of the phone, and that receives the input. This was kind of a little marketing pitch, you know, just for fun. We said, like, in 96, we had a Palm Pilot, we had a stylus and a device. We were kind of happy with that. Then in 2007, Steve Jobs said, this was not cool. We shouldn't only have the device. We should not have the pen anymore. And we say we agree, but we think maybe we don't want the device either. Um, all right. So the last of these four is dealing with hazardous stuff. Another situation where it's difficult to actually go and interact uh, directly. So this is uh, work by my student, Stefanie Müller. And she's demonstrating how to have a direct interaction with a workpiece inside of a, a high-powered laser. So what she's using is she's using a laser pointer to work directly on the workpiece rather than on some proxy. You can see this here, the little dot. It's the whole thing is observed with the camera from above. But it's very important for us to not have the interaction on top of the glass. All interaction must take place on the workplace. So it actually follows this natural, like, single Euclidean space uh, paradigm. She has actually... Um, 20 different laser pointers that give her different functions like extrude and all these construction functions and gears and so on. And uh, to actually make, well, we can also cut out physical objects and so on. All right, so that was a quick overview um, what we did in terms of 2D interfaces. So we're very com comfortable with 2D interfaces at this point, but let me show you another three projects that together kind of uh, analyze how we're dealing with 3D space. So the first one is RidgePad, and the idea is we were working on one more of these projects where we tried to bring touch to extremely small de uh, mobile devices. Um, and the question was, can we make touch much more precise? Um, the way it works is um, we're actually replacing the input technology that traditionally only senses touch with one that is so high precision that it can actually sense fingerprints. And so if you look at this fingerprint, it actually has a couple of interesting features. But when you're touching the touch screen, you're not necessarily seeing all the devices not see the entire uh, fingerprint. It may only see this. And so when you look at this fingerprint, you can be like, huh, I'm wondering what part of the finger that is. So in this case, actually, the finger pointing straight down. Let me show this again. Here's the fingerprint. Right, so if you think about the features, this actually is a finger that's rolled a little bit to the left because you can see how the core area of the fingerprint here has moved on to the right, so you kind of know that the finger must have rolled to the left. And what's interesting about this is that through touch interaction that resolves fingerprints, we not only get the participant ID, we also get these additional details uh, and we can reconstruct the position of the finger in space. Now it turns out if we have that, um, and let me actually show you a little bit of video what this looks like. This is just a regular fingerprint scan in this particular example. We can actually distinguish from rolling um, and dragging fingers because you know, things that would look just the same if we, if we, uh, if we worked with um, just a regular touch screen. Um, but based on that, we got this tremendous improvement in precision of touch because we could, by having the complete 3D position of the finger, we could actually explain what's happening in, in touch. 
So in some way, what caused this effect was the fact that there was a misconception in existing systems. Any system, actually, there are two spaces involved here. The target lives in a two-dimensional space. The finger lives in a six-dimensional space because it's 3D space and all the rotations. And when users touch, they actually need to look at the target and map that to the six-dimensional space of the finger. Now, the device needs to observe that finger and somehow find out what target in 2D space is being referred to. And the way we do this today, and that includes Apple and Microsoft and Samsung and HTC and everyone, we use the contact area for that. Now, it turns out the contact area in reality has nothing to do with touch, oddly enough. And let me show this to you. This is a follow-up study we did. This is a, a user touching that same crosshair like a couple of hundred times under different finger angles. And it turns out the contact area kind of correlates with what we're looking at. I don't know if this makes sense to you. If you stare at this for a while, try to find out what the person is trying to do here. So after looking at this for a couple of, like until the eyeballs were run dry essentially, we found that it's roughly the center of the vertical center of the fingernail, and in the x-axis is roughly the center of the finger. And that's pretty much maintained here like this. And so what we found is that touch interaction is more or less a, not a contact area, it's a visual kind of targeting. You know, it uses target visually. They kind of try to maintain, get the finger roughly on the center of this thing and roughly the center of the fingernail. And so this actually has implications on future touch devices because the devices we build today, they're all based on the assumption that the touch actually comes from you know, the contact area, which is tr tr certainly true for macroscopic objects. I'm touching this thing right now. But for microscopic things, this does not work anymore at this point. And so this actually has some implications on how we should make future touch devices. So when we were done with RichPad, we had an idea at the end. We said, OK, well, on the one hand, we can recognize objects. But more importantly, we realized that we were able to reconstruct the 3D position uh, in space of objects. So we kind of did this in a in follow-up project called Lumino. And uh, the idea of, this is actually something on Microsoft Surface. Uh, Microsoft Surface is able to recognize markers. So if you put building blocks in the surface, you can actually recognize what's going on. But we added something to that that allowed us to recognize uh, objects in 3D space. That's my student Frederick and I, and we're build, playing with building blocks. And you can see how the table recognizes the 3D assemblies of these things. So the trick how this works is we actually fill the blocks with fiber optic bundles. And you can see how there's like a, kind of some sort of a transparency effect but actually, by using fiber optics, we're actually preventing the light from blurring and actually pipe the light up and down. Here, I'm taking the bundle out. This is made of individual fibers that we actually handmade. And so as a result, the table can actually see through the light gets piped through the blocks and comes back down. Um, and we can use this to actually uh, recognize the 3D construction of these objects. So in some ways, what we're doing, again, is similar to the thing with the fingerprint. We're using um, a 2D approach to solve the 3D problem. So you can see here, this is the marker directly in touch, but this is the marker on the next level up. And uh, we can actually use that to, uh, to reconstruct things that happen in space above. The other thing we learned from this is that gravity is actually an important ally here. Because as long as we have gravity, everything, as long as my touch surface is horizontal, everything that happens in space gets pushed down on the surface. And that helps us you know, get this information. So in the next step, we were wondering if we can actually apply this to entire rooms. So here's a bit of a demo video about that. And this project is called Multitoe. So this is taken with a, with a uh, um, setup based on frustrated total internal reflection. This was an earlier prototype. The next one we built was much larger than that. But you can see there's a camera below. It's essentially like a, a larger pressure sensitive area. And we can recognize people based on their fingerprints, except that these fingerprints are now shoe prints. If people have new shoes, we need to ask them about that, the same way as with fingerprints. We initially need to ground, get ground truth there. <clears throat> you don't want a menu somewhere else. You just, you know, this thing could be large. So we invoke this in place. Here we're drawing a little polygon. This actually, the next step is very important because the user is drawing now, and someone else is going to walk through the picture without interfering, which is important. And the way how the system distinguishes that, it analyzes the gait. If you're tapping with your foot, it actually assumes that you want to interact. But if you're walking and it sees actually the sequence of, of heel and ball, it assumes that you're just walking through. We did other things like uh, head tracking, for example. People leaned around. And when we got out of this project, we kind of got really excited about this idea that we could try to predict things that happen outside the range of these, of these devices. And we're wondering in how far we can learn more about you know, entirely activities in a room. So we created this larger setup. Um, we think at some point, this is, this is kind of a placeholder, actually Ken Pearl is here. Um, so we think, for example, the unmouse pad could be one of the solutions. Any type of pressure sensor fall in the future uh, for the time, you know, it could be when we move into like a new place, we're just going to roll out some interactive carpet. Um, 
and just going to plug it in. That's going to be the tracking system of the future, maybe, we think. In the meantime, we made this, lar made this larger prototype. There's actually two rooms on top of each other, separated by 1.2 to tons of glass. Uh, it's 12 by 9 feet. And this space kind of right now allows us to bring all these ideas together that I just talked about, um, because many, many objects have fingerprints. So we start making our own furniture. This is kind of a, one of the prototypes. This actually propagates down pressure. And if you, I don't know if you just caught that these are drinking straws. And so this is my student, Nick. He's kind of leaning around. And you can see how his pressure is actually propagated down the floor in this kind of setup. There's his fr friend joining him. And uh, now they're both playing together. Someone doing crunches. And this is actually, we took this last week. So this is kind of where we stand right now. It's ongoing work. Um, so obviously, it's a bit of a stretch. We don't have full knowledge of 3D. We make these avatars, but we're looking at like how much of the data can we reconstruct. And uh, that's kind of where we stand. But we're trying right now to see even to reconstruct things that we can't see. For example, this, this leg swinging is something we absolutely cannot see. We're just uh, constructing all this based on the leg that's on the ground. But the pressure changes in that leg give us some clues about what's going on. This is the center of gravity moving around. So these are kind of the, the, the features we're, we're thinking about right now. And we worked a lot on the performance. So this is all GPU-based stuff right now. OK, there's a little bit of we're playing with physics. <laughs> we're just not good at playing soccer. We lost against Italy. I don't know if you caught that. <laughs> <laughs> and our performance is going up, so we can handle more people and stuff like that. All right, so um, summary. I, I hope I try to convince you that the world around us, well, you would probably believe that, is Euclidean. I think as long as we manage to get everything organized in a way that, that is kind of a single space, things that are easier for users will feel natural because all these laws of physics will, will persist. And um, you know, sensing using 3D is great. We haven't fully unified this quite yet. And with things like towards working towards gravity space, which is what we call this installation, we, we think we're making a step forward. All these things were published as full papers at Kai and Wist, and the others as well. And the floor is supported by Microsoft Research. So thank you for that. And I'll be happy to take questions. <laughs> and I hear we've got a minute or two or so for that. Because I ate up a lot of this time, but if you have one. Yes, if there's any uh, burning questions, uh, be happy to take them now while we just swap over to the next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Pat. The, uh, Pat, your collaborator at Microsoft Research, primarily Shwedak Patel in uh, Microsoft Research Cambridge. Uh, not, <laughs> Shrami Zadi. Shrami Steve Zadi. Hodges. I'm thinking of right. the next speaker. My yeah. apologies. Shrami Zadi in Microsoft Research Cambridge. So, no, no questions? Okay, good. Questions in the break, perhaps. Thank you very Absolutely. much, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. You have your thing? You get everything? Is there an AV person we can just help to uh, swap over the slides, please? Let me see if I, oh, see this is a touch screen here. <laughs> but it's black. Oh, here. OK, which one do you want to be? OK. OK, that would be, mm, I'm guessing, two. Podium PC, two. Oh, no, no, you said that, but now it's locked. <laughs> so while we work out uh, getting the slides across, let me introduce um, uh, Gabe Cohn from the University of Washington. Um, Gabe is uh, uh, gracefully uh, standing in representing for the work that uh, Shwedak Patel at the University of Washington, Professor Shwedak Patel, together with Desney Tan in Microsoft Research, has done. Um, he spoke uh, last, I saw him at uh, CHI, an excellent talk, so we're, we're going to see uh, 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 s uh, an update on the work. Uh, Gabe is a, uh, a, a, a beaming away third year PhD student in the ubiquitous computing lab at the University of Washington. Um, he, he's notable for uh, winning a Microsoft Research PhD Fellowship this year, as well as an, an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship um, uh, in 2010. Do you need a question? So we will pause this talk and go to the next speaker because uh, Gabe's slides aren't on the machine. Sorry about this. Okay. Gerardo. I knew this was going to be a fire hose, but I wasn't quite expecting this kind of fire hose. Gerardo, are your slides available, do you think? Let's have a look. Yes. Dr. Gerardo Gonzalez. 
is from Lancaster University, UK. He's a postdoc researcher working in the Microsoft Research Cambridge lab. We have two talks with US collaborations and two talks with uh, European collaborations. We do do NUI collaborations around the world. Hopefully next year, the Faculty Summit, you'll see some of those uh, uh, other collaborations in Latin America, for example, Australasia, and, uh, and, and perhaps even China. Uh, Gerardo, though, is uh, uh, working with Abby Sellen and Antonio Criminisi, uh, Kenton O'Hara, Microsoft Research Cambridge. Um, I think without further ado, I should just let you talk yep. uh, so we don't have me talking any further. Thank you. <laughs> no problem, thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, so basically, I'm going to um, introduce some research that is still ongoing. Um, it's about uh, using uh, touchless technology in the operating room. Um, as, um, as it was said, it's uh, a collaboration between Lancaster University and Microsoft Research Cambridge, both in England. Um, so basically, the, the, the goal of, the, of this project is to allow a surgeon to interact with medical images uh, in the operating room. Basically, what they do nowadays is uh, they rely a lot on um, medical images, uh, X-ray images, CT images, MRI images, etc. Um, and those images allow, allow them um, to visualize, in this case, the, the internal anatomy of the, of the patient um, where the surgery is going to be um, uh, performed. So um, one of the limitations of this type of, of technology is that the surgeon cannot uh, directly interact with the system. So uh, basically, because of st sterility issues, uh, the surgeon cannot go and touch keyboard or mouse. So basically, uh, he or she is constrained um, for this um, for this type of uh, of technology, which is uh, the, the standard technology that we we are used to. Um, <clears throat> In order to, um, to interact, in this case, with the, with the systems, what they have to do is to rely in, uh, on a proxy. So that proxy would be an assistant who's um, working on an on a operating um, uh, on a control room next to the operating, uh, to the operating room. And they will, uh, the surgeon will have to ask that person uh, to control the medical images on, on their behalf. So for example, uh, the surgeon would say, if they have a, a, medical, images, uh, a medical image of the patient, on the screen, uh, the patient, the surgeon will have to ask this assistant to rotate the image or to zoom in the image in, zoom in the image out, etc. Um, so basically, um, what we are proposing is to use uh, touchless technology in order to allow the surgeon to interact with the um, with the medical uh, system um, remotely. In this case, just using uh, hand gestures in order to control the the, the medical um, and the visualization of the medical anatomy on the uh, on the screen. Um, we are basically focusing our efforts in vascular surgery, uh, specifically for mi minimally invasive surgery, also known as keyhole surgery. And the idea is to place a, a stent inside the patient um, in order to uh, treat complex aneurysms of the aorta, which is the main vessel uh, uh, located in the, in the abdominal area. Um, we have developed a bespoke system for vascular surgery. And this bespoke system consists of uh, displaying on the screen a three-dimensional model of the patient's aorta. And that 3D model is going to be superimposed on a 2D fluoroscopic image uh, of the same patient. And that fluoroscopic image is uh, refreshed and updated every five or 10 minutes, depending on the, uh, on the requirements of the procedure. So basically, in order to achieve this touchless interaction with the system, uh, we are using the Kinect uh, for Windows technology. And this obviously will allow us to, uh, to use hand gestures in order to uh, manipulate the medical images that, that uh, the surgeon can see on, on the screen. As a um, summary of what I have just said, I will just play a short video. Come on, in the lead, in the lead, in the lead. <clears throat> this is how the Kinect sensor has made its mark. It picks up body movements and voice commands, projecting them onto the TV so players can race and chase in the virtual world on screen. Now it's moving to a new, more formal setting, the operating theatre at St Thomas's Hospital. Surgeons are increasingly reliant on very detailed images such as these when they carry out complex procedures. And this touchless technology gives them instant access and control of these images. That means there's no disruption at critical moments when the surgeon needs to see the operating site. Here, a damaged aorta, 
the biggest blood vessel in the body. Until recently, I was shouting out across the operating theatre to sell, tell somebody to go up, down, left, right. <coughs> but with the Connect, I'm able now to interact with that directly, get it at the position that I want um, uh, quickly, and also without me having to handle non-sterile things like a keyboard or mouse during the procedure. Refining the system for surgery has been a challenge. We're really interested in some of the research questions around how to design a system for various type of manipulations, how to deploy a system in um, an environment such as this, so it's real value add for a surgeon. This trial will soon be extended to other centres and other types of surgery. Adam Brimelow, BBC News. Okay, so, um, so basically um, one of the challenges of, of the main challenges that we have had in this type of uh, introduction of te uh, touchless technology in, in the operating room is that mainly the operating room is a busy environment. So usually there are like five, eight people, sometimes up to, t up to ten people that um, uh, make up the, um, the clinical or the medical team in order to just uh, perform one, one single um, operation. Um, Using the, the Kinect for Windows technology, one of the things that we have, uh, we have realized is that usually it's not a basic gaming scenario as, uh, as you could imagine. Like, for example, there's one single person la um, in front of the Kinect, for example, and uh, just jumping around, for example, uh, in, the, uh, in the living room. So basically, this type of uh, uh, operating room, in this case, this type of scenario, is much more constrained. First of all, um, there's a visual occlusion of the surgeon. So the surgeon is going to be um, facing a bank of monitors and on top on front of the of the surgeon there will be the patient and the patient will be placed on top of the um, of the operating t uh, operating table so um, that occlusion only will be um, detrimental in this case if we are using the Kinect for Windows just to track the whole skeleton as it is for for gaming um, also one of the limitations is the close proximity of users in this case um, the medical team is lined up lined up um, along the operating table. So there are usually, as you can see in here, there are usually three or four people just um, lined up. And the, uh, the movements, in this case, of the surgeon or, or the uh, radiologist or other uh, members of the medical team, they, they cannot move that, uh, that wide as they would be using, for example, for, uh, for a gaming scenario. Um, other, uh, another of the challenges that we have seen is um, that uh, the surgeon has to maintain a sterile area. Um, because there are two or three people next to each other and they are really uh, close in this case and they, they cannot move that much. Um, they usually hold their, their hands like this in order to, um, to maintain sterility at all times. So basically uh, they have a sterility area which is uh, from shoulder to shoulder and shoulder to waist. And if they move, um, if they go outside of this uh, sterile area, um, they will have start, they will start uh, having problems in this case of uh, uh, hygienic uh, issues in, uh, in the operating room. Uh, also, um, another of the challenges is the noise environment. The operating room can be quite noisy, um, can be two or three people talking at the same time, plus uh, the noise uh, that is uh, produced by, uh, by the medical instruments. Um, so basically all these, um, all these limitations um, have, uh, been, uh, cons have been taken in into consideration in order to define a gesture set that allow the surgeon to control uh, precisely all the, the medical uh, images and manipulate the medical images in, uh, much more um, reliable than uh, using, for example, any, any other type of, uh, of uh, technology. Um, as you can see here in this video, I will briefly show this is the depth map that is obtained by, uh, by the Kinect, and you can see uh, the person in the, in the, in the center um, is a radiologist. He, he is actually not interacting with the, with the Kinect, so let's say that Kinect is in, in idle mode. And uh, the person to the left, in this case, um, is one of the main surgeons, and he is usually operating uh, and doing the operation with the patient laying on the, uh, on the operating table. So as you can see, if we were going to track the, um, uh, the, the, the person, in this case the user, you can see there's a lot of uh, occlusion in there. So there are people just crossing each other. Uh, sometimes there are pe people passing uh, behind or holding, for example, the, um, the lamps in, in here, for, um, as you can see. So basically, I mean, that um, tells us all these limitations that we have to be aware of uh, in order to deploy a system in the operating theater. 
<clears throat> so basically, we have designed a set of gestures um, for this bespoke system. And um, well, these gestures have been uh, defined uh, in collaboration with, with, with the main surgeons. Um, um, <clears throat> Well, basically, uh, the, the idea of implementing touchless technology, as I said before, is to control the, the, uh, the medical images in there. So um, with the feedback of the surgeons, um, the system allows them to manipulate, for example, the rotation with one hand, with the right hand, whereas having more control with two hands. In this case, for example, with, with two hands, what I can do is zoom in or zoom out or pan around if I have my, my hands together. So that allows the surgeon to uh, to have more control, more precise control, instead of relying on other, on other people in the operating room, like can you rotate to the right, can you rotate more, can you rotate less, etc. Um, uh, also, uh, the system interaction uh, part of the of the um, of the project has been to allow the surgeon to uh, manipulate the images both within this uh, sterile area in order to avoid. Um, false positives. In this case, like for example, if the surgeon is moving his hand, just interacting with other people, um, how to control these sort of gestures that are not going to be recognized in order to stop, uh, for example, uh, I don't know, for example, um, rotating the, uh, the medical images in there when the surgeon doesn't want to. Um, for other type of uh, interaction, uh, the system allows the, the surgeon to uh, use voice, voice control in order to trigger some events of, uh, of the system. In this case, the surgeon can use voice commands that he or she is used to. So for example, if uh, he can, if he wants to um, uh, engage with the system or disengage with the system, if that person, the surgeon wants to um, lock the image in a, in a specific position, or if the, the, the surgeon has rotated the image and wants to go back to the, um, to the original position, he can do it with voice commands. And all of this, uh, the idea is to provide visual feedback at all times because um, it's the main interaction that, it, that it will be based, in this case, on the bank of screens uh, in front of the surgeon. <coughs> so this is also um, another video. Uh, it shows the, the interaction of the user which uh, has just started using the system. So that person is a new new user, has never pretty much uh, seen the system before, and um, he has a coach, let's say the main surgeon, who's standing uh, behind him. And, um, and it will okay, demonstrate the basic uh, interaction. Please, thank you. Uh, Kiko Control. Kiko lock image, uh, and now to Pam. Kiko control. Kiko lock image. Kiko place marker. Kiko delete marker. I'm a yellow writer. Yeah. 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 Kiko place marker. Exposition. Exposition. So as you can see, the user has got like a really posh British accent. Um, so the, the, um, as you can see in the video, the, the idea is to use one hand to hands in order to control the medical images. Um, the user can also uh, place markers, as, as you saw in the video. The markers will allow the surgeon to um, relate, uh, in this case, where the marker is placed, the 2D image to the 3D image and vice versa. Also, the surgeon can control the opacity of the 3D model just by swiping um, the hand above the shoulders. Um, so there are still um, <coughs> some feedback from the surgeons, and we are still developing and trying to improve the, the system based on, uh, on, the user, um, on the user feedback. Um, so as a future work, um, we are aiming to, uh, to implement and develop more uh, touchless interaction system for other type of medical applications. Specifically, we, are, um, we have started working with uh, neurosurgeons. And, um, 
well, in this case, uh, the idea is to create another bespoke system for neurosurgery. And uh, by being a, a bespoke system, probably we will have to change the gesture set and probably, I don't know, using, for example, two hands for, for the rotation or, or one hand, in this case, for zooming in, zooming out, depending on the, um, um, on the user uh, requirements and to adapt to the usual uh, workflow that they have in, in neurosurgery. Uh, also, um, uh, for neurosurgery, what we would change would be the, the type of medical images. Instead of using a, uh, both images, which is a three-dimensional model, of, uh, in this case of the aorta, and a two-dimensional fluoroscopic image, we will be working directly with 3D uh, volumetric models of the, of the brain. And eventually, what, we would, uh, what our aim is um, to create a gesture set, and that gesture set uh, that could be implemented for other type of uh, surgical settings in general and creating a gesture framework that could be used for any type of uh, medical applications. And finally, I would like to thank my collaborators uh, from Lexer University, Microsoft Research, King's College, and Guys and St. Thomas's Hospital in London. Thank you very much. <laughs> <coughs> Any uh, questions for Gerardo? So it's uh, Gabe's getting set up here. Um, um, I have some questions, but I think I'm tempted to uh, to wrap them up at the at the end and maybe um, um, ask it a similar question to all the speakers. We don't have a panel today, um, but I think I'll, I'll hold on a question unless there's anything else. Okay, so let me introduce reintroduce uh, Gabe Cohn from uh, University of Washington. Thank you. Gabe, you're a set up here. Thank you. So just to remind you, Gabe is uh, working with uh, uh, Professor Shwedak Patel uh, at the University of Washington and uh, also, well, it's now on the slide, Dan Morris and uh, Desney Tan at, at uh, Microsoft Research. The, um, uh, uh, th this, this work, um, Human Tenor, um, well, let me just pause. I'm just going to... Get out, of, uh, get out of Gabe's way here. <laughs> All right. So, mic on. Everyone hear me? Is on now? Yeah. Excellent. All right. So, sorry for all the technical difficulties. Um, now that we got things going, I'll talk to you about a project called Human Tenna. Um, and this is a system which uses the body as an antenna for whole body gesture interaction. Um, and so this is actually work that has been a collaboration between Microsoft Research and the University of Washington over the last two years. So it began two years ago when I was a, a research intern working with Desney Tan and Dan Morris at MSR, and it's then continued as a collaboration between MSR and UW, where I work with Shwedek Patel. Um, and so two years ago when this began, we actually had difficulty describing to people why you might want to interact with a computer using whole body gestures. They just didn't seem to understand why. And then later in 2010, Microsoft released the Kinect. And now we have no trouble at all explaining why you might want to use whole body gestures to interact with the computing system. Um, and so the way Kinect works is it's basically a camera. It has both an RGB camera and a depth camera, and it directly senses how a person is moving. And I want to take a slightly different approach. I want to get rid of that camera so that I don't have to be limited to only interacting in front of it. So I don't have to do this only in my living room. I could actually interact with my computer anywhere using whole body gestures. So I could interact in my kitchen, in my dining room, or in my bedroom, for example. <laughs> and I'm going to try to convince you that using the human body as an antenna is a way to do this. That is, with no instrumentation to the environment, there's no camera we need to stand in front of, and only minimal instrumentation to the body, we can really get these connect-like gestures without the connect. So, if you don't believe me, I'll show you a little video real quick. So here I'm going to perform a gesture. The system will recognize which gesture I'm doing and then mirror it back to me. Um, and so again, there's no instrumentation to this environment. I just walked into an arbitrary environment. I trained the system by doing a few gestures. And then I was able to simply perform gestures and it was able to recognize what I'm doing. The only sensor in this system is in that backpack I'm wearing. So let me describe how this works. I say it's human antenna, and I use the human body as an antenna. So let me give a little background on antennas, since I'm an electrical engineer and most of you are probably not. Um, so this is an antenna. This is probably something we're all familiar with. This is a typical TV antenna. It's called a bunny ears antenna because of the way it looks. 
and it was designed specifically to receive radio frequencies that are used for TV broadcasts. Now I'm going to show you another kind of antenna. This is a typical human body antenna. This is called a teenager, again, because of the way it looks. <laughs> um, but this one wasn't designed specifically to receive certain frequencies. In fact, it's really just a dielectric with a complex geometry, which works roughly as an antenna between about 40 hertz and 400 megahertz. Now, I didn't invent this. This is nothing new. Um, in fact, this is called the body antenna effect. And it's a source of interference and noise in body area networks and any kind of system that looks at electrical activity on the body, like EKG and EMG, for example. And what I decided to do was take this body antenna effect, this source of noise and interference, and turn it around and use it as my signal. So let's see how this works. So here we have our body antenna. And as I said, it works roughly between about 40 hertz and 400 megahertz. So we're going to look at frequencies below 200 kilohertz. So what's in that range? Well, this mostly electromagnetic noise radiating from the power lines and appliances in the home. So what does this noise look like? And is it harmful? Well, no, it's already there. I mean, I'm receiving it right now. We all are. And if you look at it, I measured this earlier, and this is just the signal over time. So this voltage over time, it looks like a 60 hertz sine wave with some distortions. So here in the US, power is delivered to all of our appliances at 60 hertz. And it doesn't stay in the wires. It radiates off. Um, if you look at this in the frequency domain, you can see there's that strong 60 hertz peak. And there's these harmonics which fall off. If you look at higher frequencies, you see there's also these peaks that pop up, which are far away from 60 hertz. And these are due to actual appliances in our home. So say it's our, the switch mode power supply in our laptop, or maybe it's a digital clock in one of our devices. And all these peaks are also useful in this signal. So all right, there's this signal. It's on my body. But what happens when I move? So let's take a look first at touching walls. So here, we're going to look again at the voltage over time on the lower curve. And I'm going to start not touching the wall. Then between those black bars, I'm going to touch the wall. And then I'm going to release. And it's clear that something changes. Um, clearly, the amplitude changes. Maybe other things change as well. But obviously, there's a change when I touch the wall. And this, of course, makes sense because this noise is coming from the power lines, which is in the wall. So if I touch the wall, I'm one closer to the power lines. I'm also then strongly coupled to the wall, which is strongly coupled to the power lines. So it makes sense that the signal goes up. All right, well, that might be interesting, touching walls. What if I stand in the center of my room and start moving around? So here, I'm going to put my arms out and swing my arms around. So we get a signal that looks like this. Um, and there's a lot of things going on here. We can see there's an amplitude change. There's this, what I'm going to call a DC shift, where the wave kind of jumps up and goes back down. All right, that's interesting. If I move, we see this interesting signal. Is it useful? I mean, can we actually do anything with this? Or is this really just noise that's on my body that's completely useless? Um, so we decided to explore that. Can we actually make a gesture system based on this? You know, If I perform the same action every time, are we, are we going to get the same signal on the body? So we built this apparatus to measure the signal. It's nothing complicated. We need contact to the body, because um, we're going to measure the voltage on the body an analog to digital converter, so we can digitize that signal. And then we either need to store it on a hard drive or send it over a wireless link. So over the last two years, this has gone through many different versions. The first one, which is in our Kai 2011 paper, was this big backpack. Um, and here you can see Desney wearing it. It has contact on the back of the neck. There's an analog digital converter, which is an NI DAC off-the-shelf component. Um, and then this just stores data on a laptop, which the user has to carry around. So it's big and bulky, but it showed the thing works. Later, we downsized this at Kai 2012, still have contact to the back of the neck. Now it's a shoulder bag rather than a backpack. Um, and basically, the thing here is we removed the laptop, and now the data is transmitted wirelessly. Later this summer at UbiComp, I'll present this watch form factor. So this is obviously much smaller, and this same idea still works. Now we have contact on the wrist. Um, we have a, an analog digital converter in a small microcontroller, and it's still a wireless link. All right, so we have this, and we're going to collect data. Where are we going to get this data? So we did a user study, as is done typically in CHI. Um, and we went to about 8 to 10 different homes with 8 to 10 different participants. And we had them perform a number of different actions, which I'll talk about what all those actions were later. Um, and the idea is, let's collect a lot of data, and let's go back and look at it and see if it really is feasible to make a gesture system based on this. So this is still just a feasibility study. And then we'll treat it as a machine learning problem, where we have this data. 
We want to segment out when the user is doing something interesting, extract some features from that signal to feed into a machine learning classifier. And you know, over the last two years, this is, each of these steps has gone through many versions. I'll kind of give an overview of them without going into too much detail. All right, so segmentation. Um, if we look at that signal from before when I was spinning my arms, we see something interesting. Um, if I take a low-pass filter, which is this green line, I'll call it the DC curve, we see that when the user is not moving, this, this signal is basically flat at 0 volts. And when they move, it deviates away from 0 volts. So because of this, it's really easy to tell when the user is moving. So we use this for segmentation. We can figure out, all right, during this time, the user is doing something interesting. Next is feature extraction. Um, so again, we apply more filters. If we take a high-pass filter, we can remove this DC component. And we can see here, for example, there's an amplitude change, which might be because as the user was performing the action, they moved closer to a light or a wall where the noise source was coming from. Um, and so with this signal, we extract several features. In the time domain, there's that DC, or the average value, over some window. The RMS, or the root mean square value, over some window, which gives some idea of the amplitude. If you actually take these two features alone, you can do pretty well in differentiating gestures which are largely different. But if you want to differentiate gestures that are very similar, you also need to use some frequency domain features. So we look in particular at uh, the lower frequencies, so the 60 hertz component and its first few harmonics, and also those high frequency peaks that I mentioned earlier. So remember, the high frequency peaks um, are from appliances throughout the home. And so these are really useful for finding the location of the user in the home. Because obviously, as you move around, the relative amplitude of these peaks is going to change as your proximity to those appliances changes. All right, so we pull out all these features, and then we feed it into a support vector machine implemented in Weka. Um, and all the results I'm going to show you in the next few slides are cross validation. So all the data was collected in multiple sessions, and these sessions were separated in time. And so we're always going to fold across session so that there's no overfitting. So training and testing sets are always in separate sessions. All right, so let's talk about some of the, the actions we had users do and what kind of results we got. So again, let's talk about touching the wall, because that's how I started. Um, and this is work that we did um, for Kai in 2011. So we had users go to several different walls in their house and touch at five locations around light switches. So one touch was on the light switch, and then another was above, below, left, and right. Um, and what we found is we could actually accurately determine which of those positions they were touching with an accuracy of about 87%. And so you might ask, all right, why is this useful? Why do we want to be touching walls? Um, well, this is actually very useful in essentially allowing arbitrary widgets on your walls. Imagine you print out a little sticker which says, turn the light on. And already you have a light switch to do this. But maybe you put it down low so your kids can do it as well. Um, or maybe you put another switch which says, you know, turn the music on in this room. And you can just put it somewhere on the wall. You touch it once to train it. And then any time you walk in that room, you touch that sticker, um, the music turns on in that room. Um, or perhaps you have some gesture where you touch on both sides of a light switch, and all the lights in the house turn off, which you might want to do before you go to bed or as you leave. So essentially for home automation and just adding additional um, ad hoc switches to the walls is, is one way. So the other thing we looked at in that Kai 2011 paper is the location of the user in the home. So we had users go to six different locations in their home. And simply by measuring the voltage on the body, we were able to determine which of those six locations they were in with about 99.5% accuracy. Um, and what's really interesting is we always made sure that two of those locations were in the same room. So this is actually better than room level accuracy. Um, and it, the only thing you got to do is measure the voltage on the body. So this is really interesting, and obviously having the context of which location the user is in is, is very useful for a number of applications. Um, the following year, we decided, all right, let's move away from the walls, and let's try doing whole body gestures in free space in the center of the room. And so we had users perform 12 different gestures. Some of them are kind of funny. So these are waving your arms around, spinning around, bending down, stepping to the right, stepping to the left, uh, punching and kicking. Um, and we were actually able to classify which of these 12 gestures the user was performing with an accuracy of about 93%. All right, so this is really exciting. By just measuring the voltage on the body, we can get the location of the user with near 100% accuracy. We only used six locations, so maybe that will obviously go down as there's more locations in the house. Um, whole body gestures with about 93% accuracy, and the touch positions on walls with about 87% accuracy. 
All right, so this is very exciting, but this was also just a feasibility study. We collected a bunch of data, we went back, and then we analyzed it. Can we actually make a real-time system that does this? So this last year at Kai, we explored that as well. And so this is the video I showed you earlier, where I'm going to perform an action, and the system's going to classify. So everything's happening in real time. Um, there's automatic segmentation in real time, feature extraction, and classification. Just to be clear, the, it, the system is not generating these stick figures. It, it's not Microsoft Connect. It really can't see what I'm doing. It's really just selecting between one of 12 pre-programmed gestures. So these stick figure combinations were already in the system. And as I perform one of the actions, it selects one of the 12. Um, what's really interesting about this system is that, unlike a camera-based system, we don't have problems with occlusion. So for example, I'm going to perform an action right here. And then I can turn away from the TV and face the camera and perform the same action. And it will also be classified correctly. Yep. <laughs> All right, so we also built um, a system, you know, an interactive demo, which allowed me to play Tetris you know, only using my body. Um, and then also, this last year at Kai, I decided to uh, do a live demo and change my slide simply by kicking. So I would perform a kick, and in real time, the system would classify the kick and then use that to change my slides. Um, and then we, could, we also could do other gestures. We programmed a stomp and a wave uh, in this simple system. And this is actually using the watch form factor, which will be presented this year at UBCOM. Um, and you can obviously play some simple games with that as well. Um, all right, so this is cool. We have shown the feasibility of using the human body as an antenna for sensing location of the user in a home, as well as touch position on walls, um, and demonstrated a real-time system which works for whole body free space gestures. So the question is, what's next? Well, what's next is dealing with how robust is this system. Um, at the end of the day, we are classifying everything based on noise signals. right? So what kind of training procedure is needed so that this works in general and is robust? How do we deal with the variation of the signal with location? So in all, this thing, all these things we've done so far, the user went to one location and performed a few gestures. And if they're standing in that same location and perform the same gestures, it works. If they move somewhere else, they would probably need to retrain. Um, and what happens if they're continuously moving about the space? Uh, also. You know, if a large load in the house turns on your air conditioning unit, for example, well, now the whole noise environment changes. So how do we deal with that? Well, the answer is improve feature set, which uses features which are more robust to these changes, and using a continually adaptive classifier. So a classifier that's going to change as the environment changes. Um, and those aren't going to be easy things to do, but I, I think it is possible. The other thing we can do is get away from the fact that Currently, we have a, a system which is purely passive. We're just listening to the noise that's out there. We could also inject a known signal, either on the body or into the power line, in order to make this classification much more robust. So once we do that, we'd like to really fully explore uh, the gesture set and application space that this enables. Um, and with that, I'll conclude. Thanks for listening. Any questions for Gabe? Yes, there's a question. I think we've got time for a question at the uh, current rate. So there's a mic runner coming, so just one few, few seconds. Thanks. Uh, Aaron Bobbick from Georgia Tech. Um, clearly, one of the differences is here you have a discrete vocabulary uh, that, you, that you're training and, and recognizing on. Uh, the Connect, there is a deep underlying discrete thing, but at the end of the day, they're able to recover a full skeletal uh, parameterization. Um, any progress on sort of a basis set representation or something in terms of being able to uh, recover deformations of these uh, uh, motions that you've trained on? So we haven't yet. Um, and I, I think it's possible, but it is def definitely going to be difficult, because this is definitely a very nonlinear mapping between you know, human motion and how these signals are changing. Um, what I imagine is maybe a more complementary system where you use this with Connect, and while you're in front of the Connect, you have this Connect ground truth data to continually train the system, and then maybe as you move to the periphery of the Connect or straight outside the you know range of view of the Connect, then our system kicks in. That's kind of one way I imagine that working. Thank you. 
Any other questions while we have Joe? Yes, Donald. I'm just curious if you were you were trying with with multiple different people, and I, I guess really what I'm interested in is is there a, a like a biometric aspect to this? Can you can you identify different people uh, based on how they? So if someone touches a wall, is it possible to tell anything about them? So so the interesting thing, remember in this case, the sensing is not on the environment, but on the person themselves. So by the fact that we know who's wearing the sensor, we already know who's who. Um, is it possible to put the device on our arbitrary person and know who they are if they've trained it before? Uh, I don't know. I haven't actually explored that yet, but that'd be interesting. Uh, David Culler, Berkeley. Uh, in addition to being able to do something useful with this noise, uh, there is a, a kind of subcurrent of uh, people that are actually quite concerned about the health effects of the noise that was there anyways. Uh, Marty Graham, for example, an old-time EM guy has developed these capacitors that you stick into the wall to try to suppress some of it. Is it possible that this also gives us a sense of uh, the ambient exposure to some of that, regardless of whether we do something useful with yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, it would be actually kind of an interesting system to build, either maybe clothing or some device that you wear that as you move around gives you an idea of what that amplitude is. So maybe you know where, I don't know, it's you know, more, more hazardous or where it's safer. That, we could definitely do that on the, on the body. Okay, thank you, Gabe. Thank you very much for your questions for Gabe. Any further questions, let's have, uh, have them in the break. For our um, last but not least speaker, uh, Professor Joe Laviola from the University of Central Florida has been um, collaborating with Sumit Galwani in Microsoft Research. Joe and I uh, go back a bit in, uh, in uh, robotics, which I try not to mention in every talk that I uh, attend, but uh, I've just mentioned it again. Uh, but we're very interested in robotics and Connect together. Uh, Joe is uh, um, uh, assistant professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Central Florida, and he directs the Interactive Systems and User Experience Lab. He has presented at many conferences, which are listed in his bio, and uh, you can check that out, as well as publishing many papers. Uh, 3D User Interfaces um, is, is a, uh, a book that he has produced, that so you should check that out especially. Ready to go, Joe? Yes. Okay, over to you. Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me? Mic turned up? Okay, great. So what I want to talk today about is some work that I did with uh, Sumit Gowani uh, from Microsoft Research and um, Salman Chima, who's my PhD student, that we did uh, last summer, actually, and we're continuing to, to work on. And it's called Quick Draw, where we're trying to improve geometric diagram drawing. Now diagrams, draw, drawing diagrams in general can be relatively tricky if you think about it, especially if you want to draw them precisely. Um, these diagrams are often very important in STEM related educational disciplines, mathematics, physics, chemistry, things of that nature. And uh, you know there's always, um, when you're trying to draw them and you, you want them to be very specific in terms of how they're laid out, um, if you just try to draw them on a computer, it turns out that that's fairly challenging. Uh, and it typically requires a lot of time and, and a lot of precision. Now, how, how can we do this? Well, we currently, you can do it by hand if you want, if by using a compass and a set square, for example. Um, or you can use an existing software tool. And there are a variety of tools out there, things like Cabri 2 Plus, Geometry Expressions, even Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, I used to do this in Xfig uh, years ago. Um, but with all of these tools, you still have the same problem, and, and that is, is that um, it's somewhat tedious to be able to create these drawings that you, you want to make. And what we want to be able to do is to say, well, you know, let's let natural sketching be sort of the catalyst for creating these, these geometric diagrams, and then utilize constraints to, to, to precisely do the beautification, or to, 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 to basically do the beautification in a, in a precise way. And um, this is just a brief outline. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the related work and then go into the d details. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a us usability study that we conducted. And then I'm going to show you a couple of videos showing the, the latest and greatest. So there's been a fairly large amount of work in sketch recognition and beautification. Um, I don't need to go into all of these here. You can see them. Um, and there's also been a lot of work in constraint solving. And what, but what we haven't seen is sort of 
the, the synergistic combination of those two things. And that's what this work is really focused on. It's really focused on taking the sketch recognition and combining constraint solving into it so that you get beautified drawings. Now the underlying problem that we're focusing on is that in general with sketch-based interaction, you know, even though it's a very natural and ingrained method for entering information into a computer, sketches are imprecise by their very definition. So the problem we have is we want to be able to, given a rough sketch, generate a mathematically precise diagram. Okay? And the observation that we're going to use in this case is that typically what we find is that when a user is making a drawing, we pretty much have a good idea about the constraints that they are following when they make the drawing. Okay? So they're making a rough sketch, and that rough sketch is pretty much going to give us a really good indication about what it is they're trying to draw. Okay? And then what we want to use are, are heuristics, effectively, to infer geometric constraints, and then from those geometric constraints, beautify the drawing. So what we did was we developed a system called QuickDraw, and basically what it allows you to do is to sketch diagrams using a tablet PC. And you can do it in two ways. You can do it in one go. So you draw, you can make the complete drawing and then do a recognition, or you can uh, recognize incrementally. And the reason I mention that now is because that's going to come back later in the user study uh, where, we so, where we sort of see people doing it differently. Um, and there are repercussions for that. And of course, it has the ability to, to, to clear the canvas, to, to, uh, to remove, to, to uh, scratch out ink, uh, and reposition components based on control points. And then a recognition in this case is, is triggered explicitly. So let me show you a quick video. Um, oops. Why is this not working? Oh, there we go. So this is a couple of, of, of examples. So you can see the, the system basically takes the, uh, the rough sketch and then goes ahead and does the beautification. We currently support uh, line segments and, and circles. So those are just three short little examples of how it works from a user point of view. Now internally, what we're doing here is we have a set of ink strokes, okay? And the ink strokes are just a collection of 2D points. And then we've got cusps. And cusps are regions of high curvature in the ink stroke, and we use those cusps to segment the ink strokes into line segments, okay? If it's a circle, we only got two cusps to give it the beginning and the end, and we find that there's uh, the uh, level of cur curvature is constant about the radius, so we can detect circles and line segments. So we, we enumerate all the cusps using uh, an algorithm that, that I developed a couple years ago and some, some heuristics, and that gives us a set of circles and line segments that we want to then process, okay? We also assign a numerical ordering to uh, the individual segments because that's going to be helpful when we actually process the, 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 the sketch in the, in, the, in the beautification algorithm. So now, once we've got these sort of segments, uh, we have what we need to do is be able to basically to infer constraints. And there are two types of constraints that we can think about. The first kind are implicit constraints. Okay? And that's what we're focusing on here. Now, we're going to talk about explicit constraints a little bit later. These implicit constraints are basically a number of different rules right, and patterns that we can look at based on whether or not we've got lines and, drawing, lines and circles and where they're located on the, on the, on the canvas. So for example, we can, we can infer uh, equality constraints, such as whether two line segments are equal uh, in length, whether they're parallel, whether the slope um, of, a, of, a, of, of a line segment um, provides a vertical or, or a, a horizontal component. Um, we can also look at the radius of a circle, or if a lines are tangent to the circle. So there's a variety of different ones, and they're described in the, in, in the, 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 the Chi paper. And we go ahead and we search for as many of these as we possibly can. Okay? And what these constraints are going to help us do is identify the user intent. And then the, the invariable question that you have to ask yourself is, what happens when there's an error? What happens if we don't get a constraint? Right? What, what happens if we fail to recognize it? And what we've done is we've built into the system a sort of um, 
a robustness characteristic which allows us to utilize more than one constraint at a time. So if there's more than one constraint, right, and we don't recognize it, we can utilize other constraints that we've defined and use those to help determine the beautification. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. So we have a beautification algorithm, and that's really where the, the novelty of this work comes, comes into play, where we sort of break up these uh, individual segments, these line segments and circles, into components and subcomponents. Okay? And these subcomponents are really, for example, with a line, you've got things like um, the slope of the line, you have the, uh, the, the x and y points for the end and start point of the line, you have the x and, and or y intercepts, and for a circle, you've got its position and radius. So we, we have these, these individual attributes for each of these uh, uh, elements that we're going to process. And we start off with uh, a set of these attributes for all the components, and then an empty set. And we sort of move through each of these elements, and we look to see if we can compute a beautification okay, based on what we've got in the current set. And we compute its value, and then we move forward, and we keep doing this until we sort of have moved all of the, 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 the segments, the line segments and the circles and so on, out of the uh, of set A and put it into set B. Okay? And as we do this, we, we, there's a, basically a, 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 a set of rules or hierarchy that we follow based on the order, um, the order of the drawings and also on rules uh, having to do with the actual constraints, okay? And there's a lot more detail in the in the in the uh, paper, but I, uh, you know, you, you can look at that uh, if you, if you'd like. So here's just a, a quick example. Suppose I've got four line segments, and it turns out this is going to be a square. So with these four line segments, I can infer the following constraints. I can infer that I've got two vertical and two horizontal lines. I can infer that they're the same length. I can infer, infer that the vertical lines are parallel and the horizontal lines are parallel, that I've got a connected path, and that the perpendicular distance between the horizontal and vertical lines are the same. All right? These are all the things that, I, that I, I, can, I can infer. Now, the system may not actually infer all these constraints for various reasons with inaccuracies in the drawing. But that's OK, because what the system then does is it looks to see and makes use of whatever it has available to it, which enables it or gives it a, a sort of a level of robustness that you, 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 that you currently don't have. So, for example, you could compute the slope of the left line segment, and then from that slope, knowing that we have a constraint that it is a vertical, then we can figure out what the top and bottom points are for that line. Okay? We can then compute the slopes for all the other line segments as well, and then that gives us a set of endpoints that we can then use. Okay? And as we move along, right, we may find, for example, you know, that one of the constraints is not met. But since we have constraints that, that relate to other parts of the drawing, then we can use those in order to figure out what it is that we want to beautify. Okay? That's sort of the, the basic idea. So, so in, in, in summary, what, what we're really talking about is we have a set of constraints. We're over-constraining our problem by finding as many constraints as we possibly can. And if we don't recognize them for whatever reason, we can still beautify the drawing by utilizing other constraints right, that will provide enough rules to us to help figure out what it is we need to figure out. Okay? That's sort of the, the, the basic idea. And then you, you, know, you, you may ask the question, well, what happens if none of the constraints get get uh, defined, well, then we run into problems, and then we have to come up with other solutions, and we'll, we'll see what those other solutions are in, in, a, in a little bit. So, you know, we developed this prototype, and we wanted to see how well it worked in comparison to some other existing tools. And we knew early on going into this that, you know, we just had a, really a proof of concept, and we we're going to compare it to commercial products. So we said, well, you know, let's just see what we can get. And we had 19 people. Uh, 17 male and, and 2 female used the system. And what we did was we um, basically gave them a training session, each one a training session, where they pr had three practice diagrams to try. And they did this for each of the four tools, right? Which includes uh, Quick Draw, Cabri 2 Plus, Geometry Expressions, uh, Geometry Sketchpad, and um, um, what's the other one? PowerPoint. Actually, it's five. 
So we, we, we randomized the order of the tools, we randomized the order of the diagrams for each tool, we collected feedback at the end, and we computed how long it took them to complete the drawings. Okay? And keep in mind that, you know, one of the things I, wa I want you to stress here is that we did not p necessarily put any editing capabilities into QuickDraw at, at, the, at the point of the study. You know, the only thing you could do editing-wise was simply scratch out the, the ink and redraw, where these other tools had some, some better, higher quality editing facilities. Here are the diagrams we used in the study. Um, we broke them up into three categories, easy, medium, hard, based on the number of constraints that were uh, imposed. And all of these diagrams were taken out of the NSERT mathematics book, um, which is used in India. Um, so these are all actual diagrams that, that, that are used to teach geometry. As far as the results of the study, what we found was, well, first we found that, you know, there was some error. In fact, there was an error rate of 11 and 13 percent, respectively, for people using the quick draw system for both the medium and the hard diagrams. And when I say error, what I mean is that they were unable to complete the diagram in three minutes. We sort of gave them a three-minute time frame. They said, you can't do it in three minutes and move on. So you know, it wasn't that they couldn't complete it, but they, but they just ran out of time. And we ran uh, you know, various statistical analysis on the data to get a feel for it. We found that even, even though we had some of these problems, QuickDraw performed better than PowerPoint for the easy tests. It performed better than PowerPoint and Calibri 2 Plus and Geometry Sketchpad, as well as for the medium and the uh, hard diagrams. And it was on par with uh, geometry expressions. So we, 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 we saw that from a quantitative point of view um, that, that you know, QuickDraw has some merit here. Right? It, you know, it was able to perform better at its prototype stage with a number of these different tools and no worse than a, another, another tool. So we also asked them, we asked users, you know, their, their feedback and get, get some, some, some qualitative uh, data. And, you know, uh, they, they, they tended to report that there was no real significant difference in drawing capabilities of each tool, which is kind of interesting in the sense that, you know, QuickDraw provides you this tool, this pure drawing tool, where these other tools are, you know, there's a lot more drag and drop going on with them, okay? There was no perceived difference in drawing performance except for Microsoft PowerPoint. Microsoft PowerPoint tended to be the worst out of, out of all of them. Um, and the other thing that people found was that it was no less difficult to correct mistakes in QuickDraw than any other tool. And that, that's also somewhat interesting because we did not specifically provide those um, uh, specific editing capabilities in, 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 in the QuickDraw system. And I think the reason for this has to do with the fact that it's very easy to simply just erase by scribbling out a, a piece of ink and then redrawing it. Okay. Now, the recognition obviously is an important part of QuickDraw and most of the users were, 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 were pretty positive in, the, in that regard. Okay. And QuickDraw was intended actually rated higher overall in overall reaction. So there was definitely some merit and some benefit that, 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 the, that the study participants saw. Okay. Now, there was a fairly even split among the two sketching modes. And what I mean, what I mean by that is incremental versus all in one go. And that's also somewhat interesting because we actually designed QuickDraw to work in an, in a, in an all in one go methodology. So you draw the diagram and then you recognize. But we found a lot of people wanting to get interactive in, you know, feedback. And in, it just turns out that, that the algorithm that we developed, the beautification algorithm, works in both cases. So you know, it, what it shows is, is that there is definitely a need for this more interactive feedback based on, on, on the uh, um, participants. So other feedback and suggestions we got from the users was, number one, QuickDraw enables fast drawing. There's no question about that. They also asked for editing, correcting a diagram, and QuickDraw is obviously is cumbersome, and we expected this. All right. Some people wanted keyboard shortcuts, which really kind of takes away the whole purpose of QuickDraw, but anyway, you know, some people wanted it. Um, people wanted a math recognition engine to specify angles and dimensions. Um, also the ability to add sketch to sketch constraints on the diagram. Okay. And the majority of the participants want, felt that, that, that they could use this tool in the future, which is all, obviously always what you, what you want to have. You want you know, the tools that you develop to people that will want to be able to use them once they become uh, more robust. And you know, we took these feedback and, and, and suggestions, and we've, we've added to QuickDraw since then. And um, I'm going to show you a quick video of, of some of the new things that we've added. There are subtle changes, but we believe that even though they're subtle, they're going to make a big impact in, uh, in performance. 
So you can just simply, you know, you want the radius to be a certain number, you simply draw it and you sketch, you sketch it out, and you go ahead and, and, and you, uh, you associate it to the, to the circle. Uh, we can now move uh, drawings very easily. Um, here we're, we're going ahead and creating a triangle that, that intersects these two um, circles. And we can also do things like create angles. So I say I've got this angle there, and I want that angle to be 30 degrees. And the constraint system looks at these rules, and it overrides the implicit constraints to, to support that. Um, you can see also, let's see, uh, you can, when you move a particular part of the diagram, the rest of it will follow depending on, on how you move it. If you, if you pick the, the, uh, the, the uh, for example, the, the, the radius there, it'll move everything associated with it. Here's an example of drawing a right triangle. I mean, people are drawing right triangles all the time in geometry. Uh, so we draw a right triangle. And you can specify, once again, the angles and the actual length of a particular line. And the system utilizes the underlying constraint engine to ensure that the constraints are maintained. And in this case, the explicit constraints override the implicit constraints because the user is actually telling the system, this is what I want to do. Okay. So here's just an example. We set that angle to 10, and then I set the, the length of, of, of line L0 to, to, to 8. And we're currently going to be working on a, a, another user study to see how much of a benefit this provides the user as they make these geometric diagrams. So in conclusion, what we've got here is a diagramming tool that uses a natural mode of, in of interaction. You're simply drawing on a computer. And we've developed a novel lightweight beautification algorithm. And I, and I say it's lightweight because typical constraint solving systems tend to be relatively slow. This one is much faster, works in real time, as you can see. And we also did a usability study and looked at the merits of the quick draw prototype against some existing commercial applications. And we found that it did have some merit. People were interested in it. And it did perform better uh, in, against a number of the different tools. We recognize, though, that, of course, that constraints, the, the, the sort of notion of specifying explicit constraints is still something we need to work on to improve the beautification. And we're currently doing a second study that's going to be starting soon to look at how these editing capabilities are going to improve the overall user experience and the ability to create these uh, sort of natural, precise geometric diagrams. So with that, I just want to thank uh, some people. And um, I'll take any uh, questions. For more information, uh, we presented this at CHI uh, in May, this past May. You can look at the papers, a lot more detail about the beautification algorithm and the user study and uh, various other things. So thank you. Thank you very much, Joe.